When I think about the day we will stand in heaven's sight, when all tears are washed away and we're kneeling in his sight, all the scars we've gained in battle as we journey toward the prize quickly fade away when we look into his eyes the only scars in heaven are the scars on jesus hands a reminder of love freely given love that never ends salvation is all for his glory no more broken hearts to mend the only scars in heaven are the scars on jesus hands we'll be armed with wings like angels we'll be walking streets of gold no more pain and no more sorrow we will finally be made whole as we kneel in adoration as we raise our hands in praise we will be made perfect all our wounds will be erased the only scars in heaven are the scars on jesus hands they reminder of love freely given love that never ends salvation is all for his glory no more broken hearts to mend the only scars in heaven are the scars on Jesus' hands. The only scars in heaven are the scars on Jesus' hands. A reminder of love freely given, love that never ends. Salvation is all for His glory. No more broken hearts to mend the only scars in heaven are the scars on jesus hands i want to thank all of you for coming out to our annual good friday service i have to say kind of semi-annual i guess now because we had to skip last year uh, we had to skip a lot of things, but we're back on track. Praise the Lord. So, I again, I welcome uh, each of you here today. Roger Alderton, would you open us up with prayer today, please? Dear Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to come into your house today, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for your son. You Amen. Thank you, Raj. Okay, let's see here. On the screen, we will be doing congregational hymn number 407, Near the Cross. Would you please stand for this? Thank you. <coughs> Free to all a healing stream. 
Just like Sunday mornings, isn't it? <laughs> oh, Jeff, here it is. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Bob. We make a team. I don't know how good we would do. All right. Crucifixion of Christ. Then deliver he him there unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. Where they crucified him, and with two with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. Then saith he to the disciples, Behold thy mother, and from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, an 
And they filled a sponge with vinegar and put upon it hyssop and put it to his mouth. So ends our reading. Now our second hymn, you can remain seated for this uh, at Calvary. chapter 23, and just two verses, 33 and 34. I'm going to give everybody a moment to, see if you, uh, to find out here this morning. Thank you, Ben. <coughs> and when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand, and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his divine, inspired, infallible, and inerrant word this afternoon. I had to be careful not to say this morning. Uh, that's his Sunday, usually that's on Sundays. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this amazing day. And Lord, we thank you for your amazing grace that we as believers have found through your son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. And Jesus, we thank you for doing your Father's will, for coming here into your earth, into your creation. We 
And you became word in the flesh. And you gave your life so that we could have an opportunity to go to the Father for all of eternity through you, the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, we ask that you would open up the heart and mind of each one of us today to hear the truth of your word as we celebrate your just truly, truly apt named Good Friday. Lord, we ask that it would be easy to speak and easy to listen to. And Father, Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know your son, Christ Jesus, as their Lord and Savior, that perhaps a word would be spoken or a seed would be planted today for them to finally realize in their life that if they want to have eternal life, that they have to go through Jesus, and he has to become their Savior and Lord, and their sins have to be forgiven by you, God the Father. Now, Lord, I ask, Father, for those of us that are your disciples that follow you, Lord, even as we celebrate this Good Friday and uh, the Easter season, Lord, let us, uh, let, her, let us never forget, uh, Lord, that there is a lost and dying and hurting world out there, Lord, and it's all around us. We ask, Father, uh, Lord, that you would give each one of us opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with anyone and everyone that will have an ear to listen, as Jesus was off to say. Oh, Lord, we commit this time to you. Lord, I ask that you would just uh, put the words in my mind, draw them forth from my mouth as your vessel, and may your kingdom and your name be magnified and glorified. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Today's message is called Famous Last Words. Now these are generally spoken and are, are meant by people to uh, make a claim. And usually it's uttered as a bold proclamation about something in their life. Now, people that know that individual may perhaps give a quick retort, and it's generally not in a very positive way, it's generally always in a negative way, but they will say, famous last words. Anybody ever have that happen to you? Amen. All right, yeah, yeah, okay, we got Georgie, Georgie's on us with this, all right? I think we all probably have, and have been, and been on both sides uh, uh, of that coin. Uh, in this in this subject now here's a couple examples that I uh, came up with out of a multitude of them how about when in Isaiah chapter 15 or 18 I can't remember quite off the top of my head when Lucifer said I will be like the most high famous last words <laughs> Lucifer how about the words from Goliath to the shepherd David. Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Oh, Goliath, those were very, some very famous last words as you hit the ground uh, with a thunderous echo. How about pre-World War II British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain he had met Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. He got off a plane back in England, and as he walked down the steps, he had a piece of paper in his hand, and he was waving it, and he made a great announcement. He said, we have achieved peace in our times. Oh, oh Neville Chamberlain, famous last words, because he no sooner got those words out, and Germany was dropping bombs <laughs> across Europe. And how about... Any of you ever watched the, the Rocky movies? Rocky Balboa? Anybody ever seen those? How about in Rocky IV? The big Russian, Ivan Drago. He looked down on Rocky and he said, I will break you. Ah, oh, famous last words. Because Rocky put a thumping on him when it was said and done, didn't he? And if you didn't know that, well, now you do. But these are famous last words. <clears throat> Charles Darwin. I'm not the least afraid to die. I bet you he changed his tune real fast when he took his last breath in this world. Amen. Famous last words. 
Charles Darwin. Then there are famous last words that are just simply that, last words. Michelangelo, I give my soul to God and my body to the earth, my worldly possessions to my nearest kin, charging them to remember the sufferings, not of himself, but of Jesus Christ. Yeah, those are famous last words, absolutely. How about Nathan Hale out in um, the early days of the American Revolution? He had, been, he had been caught as a spy spy by Brits. And as he was standing waiting to be hung for sedition, he said, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. How about a man by the name of Wallace Hartley, uh, Wallace Hartley, he was the bandmaster of the unsinkable ship, the Titanic, that we know in 1912 met its destiny. And just before Henry Wallace Hartley was swept overboard, he looked at his fellow band members and he said, gentlemen, I bid you farewell. Famous last words. Famous last words can, can be a retort of mocking words to a bold talker, or they can be long-lasting words by people that were trying to make a difference to others as they exited this world. The seven utterances of our Lord Jesus from the cross, to me, are the most famous last words of any dying person. These words were not said in boldness, nor in a braggadocious manner or way, but they were said to be a light in the great darkness and as proof that Jesus was really God in the flesh. He was exactly who he said he was. His first words we read today, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. Our Lord and Savior, be beaten to a pulp, bleeding like a thief, exhausted from lack of sleep and physical trauma, his lungs screaming for lack of oxygen, his heart beating so heavy as if it were probably about ready to burst right out of his chest from the lack of that needed oxygen and blood that was not pumping properly through his system. Can you imagine the cramps in his feet and his legs due to dehydration? And the blood and sweat dripping down and burning his tired, tired, burning eyes. Yet, and I mean yet, Jesus pushed through the agonizing pain, through the searing, torturous weight of our sin and our shame upon his shoulders, so that he could publicly already act, and think about this, he was already acting as our mediator and intercessor of mankind, Amen. asking the Father to forgive because he really didn't know through spiritual eyes what they were doing. I ask you today, brothers and sisters in Christ, if our Lord could do that impaled on a cross, can we not offer forgiveness for those that have done aught against us? Amen. And can we not forgive? Because we find here the greatest example of them all. Next, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Amen. This was a response to one of those two criminals that were being crucified with him. Both he and his mate, we'll say, on the other side of Christ, they had been part of those that were mocking Jesus. But I think as death began to become nearer to this man, that the Holy Spirit got a hold of him, got a hold of his heart. And he was no longer mocking Jesus. He was asking Jesus 
to save him. Not physically, but spiritually. Death was crawling closer. And by his acknowledgement of Jesus as the son of God, I believe that that criminal inherited eternal life at that moment. Now listen. Jesus was not referring to heaven when he said, today I will meet you in paradise. What he was talking about was the, uh, the part of Hades where the souls of the saints pre-resurrection went upon their death. It is here where Satan held those souls captive. Jesus, as his body lay in state, descended to that place during the time from 3 p.m. until the early morning hours of the first day of the week. He did so to reveal to those souls that he was who the prophets had claimed he could be and would be. And as the scripture tells us in Colossians, that at the ascension, he broke open the gates of paradise. And he was emptied out as those captive souls followed him into heaven. Folk, I'm not sucking that out of my thumb. That comes directly from the word of God. Amen. Yeah. That thief's soul that Christ had saved that day, three days prior, yeah, he was among them. And you know what? If you're a believer, we're going to meet them all someday, Amen. including that thief that was saved in the nick of time. You want to sit and talk about some famous last words? Number three, woman. Behold thy son. Man, behold thy mother. Traditionally, in Christ's day, if a woman became a widow, her oldest son took over as her caretaker and as her protector. And she would move into his household, or they would be like the Amish do. They would build a little uh, L on the existing home, and the mom would move in there, but her, her care was under her oldest son. I see it that even from the cross, the love for Jesus toward his mother was prevalent in his mind. See, by natural means, he should have been placing his mother's life and future um, good fortune into the hands of his next oldest brother. Ah, but remember something now. His brothers and sisters all rejected him. As the Messiah, did they not? They did. So I see it that the next associated male that was close to Jesus would have been the great apostle John. The love between those two men, and I'm talking phileo, brotherly love, I think was similar to David in the Old Testament with Saul's son. There's also scholars that believe that James and John were actually cousins of Jesus. So to me, when you start adding two plus two equals four, then maybe it was natural then, if he did not have his brothers to count on, that maybe the next blood kin would have been John at that day, on that day. Those of you that have been around me for a while, you know that I'd like to dig deeper into what the scripture says. Yeah, just to, you know, just to um, try to find more and more and more. And, and, and I really think that there's something to this is why he gave his mother's welfare to John. So what Jesus was doing, he was comforting his mother's mind that she would be physically taken care of as the transfer of her well-being in future was being given to John. And now, John, in essence, was becoming her son too. 
at that moment. Now, those famous last words, part one, part two, and part three, Jesus, if you were noticing, was not praying for anything for himself. He was praying for others, even on the cross. Now, we are going to enter in where Christ, and I don't like to use the term self-focused because I don't think that would be accurate, but it was here that Jesus began to look past this earthly life. Here, to me, was the most heartbreaking of all his statements. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Or in the Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Eli, Eli was Hebrew for my God, my God. And then he said in his natural dialect that he used most often, he said, Lama Sabachthani. In Aramaic, that meant, has, Why hast thou forsaken me? Those were the very same words that opened up the 22nd Psalm. This was the moment in time that I honestly believe is what Jesus was begging his father in Gethsemane to take from. I've heard people say, oh, he was trying to escape the cross. No, he wasn't. He couldn't. He, know, he knew that he couldn't. The cross was his destiny. His cross, the cross is what was going to bring the fruition of his father's plan of redemption. I do not believe it was the cross that he was trying to uh, have taken. I believe it was the separation that he was going to experience between he and his father. Amen. Because they had never been separated, ever. In eternity past or eternity present. I think that's what he was begging to have removed from him as he suffered in Gethsemane. And I think knowing that this was coming was the most weighing on him even above his passion itself. Knowing that he was going to experience a separation from he and his father that he had never felt before. To be separated from his father in heaven, to Jesus, I believe it was a foreign concept. He had never experienced, it was a foreign concept to his emotions and to his spirit. And I believe that Jesus dreaded the thought. But in the end, he said, Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. The reality of this, I think, hit him hard. And thus, in his agony in the flesh, he cried out these words from the cross in distress. But I don't believe in distrust. You follow me? I believe that from the cross, he cried out those words because he was suffering greatly. We can't even imagine, can we? Not me. I don't think he ever lost trust in his father. These were words of distress and not words of distrust or truly questioning. Number five, I thirst. I've been really dry up here this afternoon. I'm, and man, can you imagine? <laughs> Uh, that's nothing compared to what Jesus had endured. I want to ask you a question. Does it seem at all ironic that the individual that created the seas and the oceans and the rivers and the streams and the wells and the springs and the reservoirs in this world actually had to say, I thirst? Doesn't that seem ironic? It is in my mind. We know he was offered a sponge with vinegar and gall. A gall was a sedative agent that would numb his senses. And Jesus refused because he had to feel the full effect of that passion 
as their sins upon his shoulders were weighing heavier and heavier and heavier. He had to feel everything to know how we would feel. Every bit of pain as he bore. I would be willing and bold to say that there would have been very few people that were experienced what Jesus did that would not have been begging for a sponge full of gall and vinegar to take them mentally out of the, out of the way. Now knowing that the end was starting to draw near, now this would have been in the third part of his crucifixion, Knowing that it was drawing near, Jesus said, I thirst. And again, we find in the scripture that, another, that a sponge was offered to him again, but something was missing the second time. It doesn't mention gall or the sedative agent. And I think the reason for that was is that he had just prior rejected the vinegar and the gall with the sedative. So they knew that he wasn't going to take it. So they offered him just a sponge filled with the vinegar. And it says that he took. Man. Upon his parched, swollen, and beaten lips, and likely unable to hardly even swallow because his tongue would have been swollen due to dehydration. It wasn't a draught of, I think it was something that barely touched his lips. And can you imagine the pain that seared through his mouth when that vinegar touched all those broken, the, the broken lips and that swollen tongue? It just didn't seem like it was ever gonna end. But it eventually did, and we're going to hit that. Jesus said, It is finished. Some more famous last words that these all have been. So, again, I throw a question at you today. What, what was finished? What was finished was his mission. To see that his father's plan of redemption had come to fruition. Do you know that from the cross and through the passion that there were no less than 25 messianic promises, particularly on crucifixion day, that came to fruition and came about? At age 12, he said that he had to be about his father's business. And he had to be about his father's work. His life in this flesh, his ministry in his spirit, his destiny had been accomplished. Something else that was accomplished at the cross was Satan's fate was assured. And it was double locked down at his glorious resurrection. Jesus had run the good race. He had finished the course. And he had kept his faith and trust in his father. And in his father's love and plan. He concluded by acknowledging that his spirit was going to leave his body. And be placed in his father's hands. Father, into my, thy hands I commend my spirit. In life and death, he had always kept his father's will. And in death, it would be no different. The temporary separation really was just for a brief moment in time. Now with him mustering one last breath, I think he shouted those words. Father, into my hands I commend my spirit. These were words of total trust and faith 
that he would be with his father once again. And I'm going to be wrapping up here, Bill, pretty soon. That, come on Sunday mornings, that's a little bantering that Bill and I do together. Seven separate statements. It could have been more. It could have been less. But if it would have been, it wouldn't have been perfectly numbered by using the perfect number of God. I think there was correlation. That Jesus said seven different things on the cross as he was completing his father's mission. And he used that perfect number of seven. Six utterances in anguish and in strife and in the flesh. And the last completing and signifying completion or entering into that day of proverbial rest. I'm going to tell you something interesting that I discovered. You know, if you're like me, you've probably read these multiple times, these scripture texts. But have you ever noticed that you can read and read and read the same thing? And every time God will open up just a little more of it to you, or he'll present a gem for you to pick out one more time from that scripture text. Well, here's what I discovered. That if Jesus had seven utterances, which I believe had direct correlation to the perfect number of God, there were six utterances from the people to Christ when he was on the cross. I think that was no accident. I think it was six because six is the imperfect number of man. Can you see how God the Father had put this all together? This is what they said. Thou that destroys the temple in three days and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. He saved others, but he himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and then we'll believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. This man calleth for Elijah. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Six times Christ was mocked. And again, I truly believe that it was significant because it, I believe it represented this, the number of man. Wow. Some famous last words there, huh? Amen. And God put an explanation point on it. When the thunder rolled and the ground began to shake and the temple veil was torn in two, which paved the way for us for all time to have direct, direct relationship and fellowship with God. That was nothing that man could do. Only God could provide that for us through Jesus Christ. The human race has given famous last words many, many times as we've related to just a few of them today. But none compare to the famous last words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on Calvary's cross. He did it for you, and he did it for me. He did it so that all of mankind and humanity could have the chance to know God the Father in a personal way and to spend eternity with him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And that was proven at the cross of Calvary through those famous last words. And then three days later, glorious 
and grand and supernatural bodily resurrection from the grave. You and I will maybe have some famous last words along life's way, but nothing that you nor I can ever say can ever be more important than what Jesus said on crucifixion day. That's the message. Famous last words. At this time, we're going to take communion together in Christian fellowship. I'll give everybody a moment because those seals can be a little bit challenging. Oh, yeah. So I learned to open mine ahead of time. I cheated. You know, there are two great ordinances that Christ gave to the church. One was water baptism after conversion. When we get down, where we go down in the water in death with Christ, but yet we go rise back up again in glory and in life. The other, Christ instituted just before he began his passion. Jesus and his disciples had gathered in that place called the upper room. And as they sat about, Christ told them again about his impending passion and what was to lie ahead of him. And as he did so, scripture tells us that he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which will be shed for you. Take, eat in remembrance of me. Lord, I ask that you would accept our heartfelt gratitude and thanks as we partook of that bread in remembrance and in memory of Jesus. The scripture then tells us that he took the cup and he passed it among the disciples. And as he did that, he said these words, speaking of famous last words. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant, the blood of the New Testament. He said, this is my blood, which shall be shed for you. Take drink, remembrance of me. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would accept, Lord, our heartfelt gratitude to you and to our Lord Jesus for that shed blood that was spilled the whole distance from the Praetorium to the Via della Rosa up Calvary's mountain upon the cross and as it dripped to the ground below. We thank you for that shed blood it was extended for each one of us. We thank you for our salvation, Lord. As Paul said, as oft as you do this act, do it in memory of your Lord Jesus. And that we do today with grateful and thankful hearts. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand? I take nothing for granted, folks. The altar is open today. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, why not let today be the day? The day that Christ gave all he had for us. Wouldn't that be a marvelous thing to give all that we have to him? And come to know him as Lord and Savior and God and King. There's only one way to heaven. Amen. And that's through him, Jesus. It's not of good works. It's not religion. Jesus didn't come for religion, folk. He came for a relationship. Amen. The altar's open. I can't save you, but I can introduce you to the one that can. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have a burden on your heart today and you're a believer, these were made for you too. Come.
cast your cares upon Jesus because the Godhead first cared for you. Lay it at the foot of the cross today. Give it to Jesus. Relent and let God be God. The altar is open for you today. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, but now I see. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this glorious, beautiful day, Lord, that you have made for us. And Lord, we thank you for it. Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would be with each one of us, Lord, as we complete this Lord's Day, this Good Friday, you know, Lord, and as we celebrate, you know, Lord, the coming resurrection of you, our Lord Jesus Christ, on Sunday morning. And you know, Lord, I ask for traveling mercies for each one. Lord, I ask that you would give us a, a, a opportunities in these next few days to talk to and to speak to others about the gospel of Jesus Christ and that Christ came to save and to seek that which was lost, which was them. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this time, and Lord, for this time of fellowship. We do it for your honor and for your glory. Amen. And now, may the love of God, the joy of his Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our soon-coming King, and the peace and the power of the Holy Spirit, may they each go with each one of us, now and forevermore. Amen. amen and amen. I truly thank you all for coming out today in the middle of the afternoon as it is such. God bless you and keep you. And brothers and sisters in Christ, always remember, if I don't meet you again in this world, I will meet you in the air. Blessed be the ties that bind our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of Christmas mind is like to that above. Thank you all. God bless you. If I don't see you, happy Easter and anniversary, I guess. Happy Easter, everybody. Thank you.